invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter. Actually, we're going to look at chapter 9 today. And let's pray. Once again, Jesus, we invite your presence. And we invite ourselves into your presence. We open our minds and hearts to hear from you, from your word, we pray in your name. Amen. So in Isaiah chapter 7 through 12, you have a story unit. If you want to be reading this section, it's just read Isaiah 7 through 12. And in this passage, as we've seen, there are three children that are born as signs. Um, if you'll recall in chapter 8 and verse 18, Isaiah says, Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me for signs and wonders in Israel. Children can definitely be signs and wonders. Amen? And as we saw in chapter 7, the first child that shows up in the story is Shir Jashub, whose name is a small sentence. Um which literally means a remnant or a remainder, a residue, a few leftovers will return. Um, it's a noun and a verb. Um, the remnant literally is returning or will be returning in completed action. And you'll recall that this little one was taken along with Isaiah when he first went to confront or meet with Ahaz who was it says his heart was trembling like the trees in the wind because of those two armies about to invade from the north who had one purpose, and that was to depose and probably kill him and put somebody else on the throne. And God says, go see him and take little remnant along uh, as a sign. God says they won't succeed at displacing you on the throne. But why don't you take a stand for me and I can keep you standing and ask for a sign, I'll give you evidence. And he says, no, I won't engage. And he was absolutely determined to solve his problems the current popular way. Political alliances and you worship all the gods of your enemies in hopes to appease them so they won't come after you. Now, little remnant will return. What would what would the idea of remnant will return imply? That there's going to be an exile, right? There's no remnant to return at this point. But the army's coming. And of course we know the story now that Israel killed 110,000 of his best warriors in one day, took 200,000 captive, Aram, the Damascus group, they also took a multitude of captives. But when all those captives arrived in Samaria, God sent a prophet named Oded who said, you guys are already in big trouble with God for your idolatry, and now you're going to enslave your brothers, your cousins. You're in really big trouble. And they said, well, what shall we do? They said, send them home. And they actually clothed and fed and transported them back down to Jericho and let the people come down and get their relatives and take them home. So right within the next few weeks, Ahaz saw the prophecy of this kid fulfilled. An exile didn't have to happen if he would have taken the challenge to give God a try, but it did because he wouldn't. But even in the midst of our own failures, because we won't trust God, God pulls a few pieces together and brings them back home. Now this little guy's name will show up in today's passage over in chapter 10. And we'll see that there's a bigger story with this remnant returning. All right? The second child is when God says, would you... Uh, Asked for a sign. He said, no. And God says, fine, I'll give you one anyway. The woman, the young lady, the Alma, the word for a sexually mature, marriageable age young woman, not the Hebrew word for virgin, 
um, the young woman will conceive or being pregnant bearing a son will name him Emmanuel and God plants in the household of Ahaz little Emmanuel or in the household there in Jerusalem where he's uh, in the community a little reminder his his name is also a sentence Im is with and Anu is the form of the uh, third person singular pronoun with us the verb is implied and then you have the word El for God the short form form of Elohim so literally with us is God and this is a indication that's going to abide for the next several decades there in Jerusalem that God has stated that he hasn't gone anywhere doesn't matter how bad you've been what you've done where you've gone and how long you've been at it God is always with us there's a problem he can't do anything for us when he won't when we won't let him when we keep saying go away you know like teenagers to a parent leave me alone you know that we are loath to fulfill that desire because we know how much they need us right but eventually if God respects our free will and love gives free choice true freedom you can't have love without true freedom then eventually love has to respect rejection and go away but how far does God go he doesn't go anywhere he just leaves us alone he leaves us to our own devices he lets the stuff happen that he could prevent there's a very important point here God doesn't cause calamity even though he claims he does this world is under the curse of sin if God were not restraining the evil one second Thessalonians 2 talks about that if he let Satan have full control there would be nothing in this world worth living period there would be no joy, no holidays, no good food, no security. There would be nothing but chaos, a war zone in the, after, the, after the bombs. Just chaos. And so God, the only reason we have life at all of inequality is because God is muting the evil one. The blessing isn't the blessing is the muting of the evil one which allows good things to happen God things to happen but if God goes away like we tell him to through our sinning through our idolatry through our self-centeredness if we keep saying God go away and leave us alone he doesn't really go away but he leaves us alone and when he leaves us alone, when he stops the muting of the power of the evil one, chaos happens. And God will call it his scourge. He brought it. How did he bring it? By stopping the blessing. I don't believe God brings evil, even though he says I created good and I created evil. How did he create evil? Well, if he hadn't created anything, then nothing could be broken, right? Evil is not a creation. It's breaking the stuff God made. And when he gave freedom, he actually made it possible for us to choose to not love. And when you don't love, you end up breaking everything. So God made evil possible because he creates with love and he creates stuff that can be broken when evil comes in. But God says he takes responsibility for the whole thing. He steps up and takes responsibility. He never goes anywhere, but he does finally leave us alone. And when he leaves us alone, chaos happens. But he's always near and available whenever we choose to engage. He will step in immediately and begin some kind of amelioration of what we have brought on ourselves. We don't have to go on a long pilgrimage to find him again. We don't have to do a bunch of penance to get him to come back. He's just there waiting for us to engage. He's never far away. And the rest of Ahaz's life, God is 
making his presence known as little Emmanuel grows up. Of course, there's two other aspects of that prophecy. He's going to grow up eating milk and honey. Wait a minute, there's two armies at the northern border. They're going to rape and pillage the land. If, if they win, there will be nothing left. We'll be on starvation. God says, no, 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 I'm not going to let him do that. Uh, there's going to be loss. There's going to be exile. There will be remnants to return. But the good times will come back. This kid's going to grow up in milk and honey. And before he's old enough to make decisions, about 12, these two nations that are invading you will be completely gone. And indeed they were. So once again, we have a little prophecy, a little prophetic kid here whose presence is a statement from God. And then we had in chapter 8, little Maher Shalal Hashbaz. How would you like that for a name? Imagine having to sign your name. Speedy to plunder, rushing to the spoils. And here God says, this kid's going to be born. And before he's old enough to say mama or dada, his very first words, the spoils that were taken from you by the two invading armies will be taken from them by the king of Assyria. So within a two-year period, Ahaz had three kids show up. all of whose names were prophecies and the prophecies concerning these kids happened. God is trying to give Ahaz a reason to believe. This guy refuses to engage God and God keeps saying, come on, I'm showing you what I can do. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. And he will not. Little Speedy to Plunder predicts the imminent plundering of the plunderers and the ultimate destruction of the destroyers. I like the book of Revelation. It talks about God finally destroying the destroyers. That's a just thing. If someone is only hell-bent on destruction until they're destroyed, there will be nothing but destruction. God will ultimately have the destroyers be destroyed, the plunderers will be plundered, and he'll bring it all home. Which remember, that's what he did. The Israel, Northern Kingdom, and Aram came and plundered Israel. Two years later, Assyria came and took all that plunder away. Thirty years later, Assyria came to destroy Judah, and a Hezekiah chose to trust God and God said watch me fight for you and one angel slew 185,000 of them in one night and the Israelite or the, Ju the, the people of Judah spent the next three days bringing home all the plunder <laughs> the plunder went north the plunder went further north the plunder came south and the plunder came home God says if you'll let me have your allegiance and your trust, I can bring it all back home. Amen. All right. Now, within this passage also are three prophecies of Messiah. We've looked at two of them. The first one is Emmanuel. We've already talked about him. And, of course, the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, translated about 200 years before Christ, actually translates the woman will conceive, the Alma is the Hebrew word, will conceive, with the Greek word for virgin, and Matthew picks that up as, in Matthew 1, a prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, which is amply attested to in Matthew 1 and the first three chapters of Luke. And this is a, uh, a prophecy of Jesus coming to be with us, and he became human, and when he rose from the grave, he was still human, right? Flesh and blood. I'm hungry. You got something to eat. You didn't see it go down, right? He wasn't clear. He wasn't transparent. He was a real human being. God became one of us, God with us. And Jesus, although he's um, with the Father right now preparing places for us, he sent the Holy Spirit as his replacement. He's coming again, and he's still with us. He'll be one of us forever, for eternity. God with us. He's never far away. Again, no matter how far you stray, how far you go, 
If you tell him to leave you alone, he eventually will, but he doesn't go far. The, the faintest whisper of help, and he's right there. You don't have to go on a long pilgrimage. You don't have to go through a bunch of penance. The moment you engage, he's there. And then the second one is the child that is born in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Remember we talked about the fact that as Assyria moved south, like the floods of the Euphrates River overflowing its banks and flowing south, uh, Assyria, first of all, fulfilled Ahaz's desire as an ally and flowed over and destroyed the kingdom of Aram, Damascus, and flowed on down within those first two years after the story begins and reduced uh, Israel to a third of its size. And this was the first permanent loss of territory for Israel since the exodus and coming in and conquering Canaan. When Israel came into Canaan, they conquered the territory, or God conquered it for them, and they filled the land. And from time to time, they went into idolatry, and they were invaded, and they were enslaved, and then they'd cry out in repentance, and God would raise up a deliverer, and the invader would be expelled, and the people would be brought back to freedom. The land was never permanently lost. But as Assyria comes south, the first to be permanently lost is Galilee, the land of Naphtali and Zebulun. And that's when this child is born. It says he will bring light first in the land of Galilee, Naphtali, and Zebulun. And where did Jesus first proclaim his ministry? In Galilee. And his light came on south, just like the darkness had moved on south over the, pre, over the subsequent years. You know, the first invasion, then 10 years later, Samaria was completely destroyed and Israel is gone. 100 years later, um, Babylon came and destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah until literally the whole land was desolate in darkness. Where did the light begin to dawn? Right where the prophecy says, in Galilee. And this child would be born the government would be on his shoulders. He'd be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His government would increase, peace would increase without end on the throne of David. To order and establish justice and judgment from this time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Notice the prophecy here is that God intended Jesus to be accepted, his sacrifice to be um, received. Uh, salvation received and that he would rise and rule and that his expanding kingdom of peace would go from then and forever but because of his rejection this prophecy had to be modified remember God's intent is good I have plans for you of good and not evil to give you a future and a hope but if we won't let him in, he can't fulfill his plans like he wants to. It doesn't mean he doesn't tell us what he wants to do. But when we will not submit, trust, let him do what he wants to do, does that make him a false prophet? The fact that this prophecy does not come to pass exactly as said here is not because God didn't come through. It's because we didn't let him come through. Now, I'm glad God tells us what could have been. He doesn't plan on our failure. He says, this is my plan. We're going to get the light to dawn again, and it's going to sweep on down, and, and this child will bring the government under his control of peace and justice from that time on forever. It's going to grow until it envelops the whole earth. And like it said in the early earlier couple chapters of Isaiah, all nations will come up to the house of the Lord. There will be peace on earth. Couldn't happen that way. He was rejected. He rose. He ascended. We're under plan B, I call it. Revelation is where God took all the pieces in the Old Testament and rearranged them into the plan B scenario so we can see how it's actually going to happen now. He will come he will reign. That's going to happen. But we didn't have to go through a 2,000 year interim. 
Then there's a third prophecy of Messiah, which actually parallels this, and it's over in chapter 11, but we have to get there. So we're going to go to chapter 9 now and verse 8. We finished the, the child is born section. In chapter 9, verses 8 through chapter 10, verse 4, we have four sections where God tells the northern kingdom of Israel through the prophet Isaiah what's ahead for them if they will not repent. The Lord sent a message, verse 8, against Jacob. It's fallen on Israel. That's the northern kingdom. All the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we'll rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores were cut down, but we'll replace them with cedar. Therefore the Lord will set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies on, the Syrians before, the Philistines behind, and they will devour Israel with an open mouth. God says here, you've experienced some calamity from invasion. Buildings have been destroyed. Property has been destroyed. The trees have been cut down. And instead of seeing this as a warning of what happens when I begin to back off because you tell me to go away, and God backs off slowly, hoping that as bad things happen, we'll realize we're on the wrong path and turn and call for help. And as you've seen me back off and calamity has come from invasion of, and war, What's your response? Oh, so they knocked down our brick buildings. We'll rebuild with marble, hewn stone. We'll rebuild better. And they cut down all the trees. Well, they were just sycamore trees. We're going to replant with the cedars of Lebanon. Yeah. You may have caused us trouble, but we're going to come back even better. You ever heard that kind of rhetoric? You realize this statement, the bricks have fallen down, we'll rebuild with hewn stones. Notice it says these are words of what? Rebellion. Refusal to recognize that you need some help from outside. Things are falling apart. One of the most fascinating things, and I'm not going to spend time there because we don't have it today. Maybe we'll come back for a whole morning on this section. But after 9-11 in two different official government settings this verse was quoted you may have knocked these buildings down we'll build a better one and this ver was, verses were quoted by politicians to encourage our people and they didn't read the context and realize it's a statement of utter rebellion and then there were a few radio preachers not that I agree with them necessarily but they had the audacities to suggest that 9-11 was a judgment of God and they were castigated, they were called haters, they were called everything in the book by the politicians and the media because they dared to say this might be a judgment of God. Now, I don't agree with the way they explained it. Because once again, God does not do these kinds of things. But when we keep telling him to go away and leave us alone, eventually he has to leave us alone. And when he leaves us alone, chaos happens. And if we will re-engage... He can bring blessing. So yes, I believe we do need to see these things in Hurricane Katrina and other of these disasters that have come, unprecedented level stuff. Do we call them judgments of God or do we call them the natural results of God backing off when we tell him to leave us alone? We've taken him out of the public dialogue. We've told him we don't want him in our schools or in our, in our education, our science, in our government, in our public square. And so he backs off. And when he backs off, that's the blessing going away and the chaos comes in. So I may not agree with the theology of those who said these were judgments of God, but I'm not sure that they were too far off in reality. God says to Samaria here, my backing off, you're not learning, you're just rebelling. And he gives this phrase, last part of verse 12. For all this his anger is not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. I'll tell you what I wanted that verse to say. God says, if, you know, I've let these things happen, but that doesn't mean I'm done letting things happen. You still won't let me back in. He says, my anger is still there. I don't know if we can understand this. My anger is not turned away. 
un unless, and, and I can only talk about this from theory, but I, I think I can understand the anger of a parent regarding a wayward child. I've seen some very angry parents. Angry at what's happening, angry at what their children are doing to themselves, angry at what their children are doing to the family, but not hating the child. But angry at the chaos and the carnage that's coming in. I don't think this is a... This is a righteous anger. But then it says, my hand is stretched out still. When God's hand is stretched out, so often in the Bible, that's a picture of God saying, but I'm still here to save. But I have to admit, the more I read this passage and the way Isaiah uses the same phrase earlier on, this really looks like God is saying, my hand is still stretched out for even more calamity. Next section. Verses 13 to 17. The people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush. In one day the elder and honorable, he's the head, the prophet who teaches lies, he's the tail. The leader of his people will cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, his hand is stretched out still. Just to make it real short there, God says, uh, your, your leaders, your kings, your rulers are going to lead you in the wrong direction. So the first thing is invasion and chaos. The second thing is internal leadership corruption. If we won't follow him, our leaders become corrupt. Duh. Anybody noticed anything? But God says, I'm not done yet. For the wickedness, verse 18, burns as a fire. It will devour the briars and the thorns and kindle the thickets of the forest. And they will mount up like rising smoke through the wrath of the Lord of hosts. The land is burned up. The people will be as fuel for the fire. A man will not spare his brother. They will snatch on the right hand and be hungry and devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. The man will eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh will devour Ephraim and Ephraim to Manasseh. Internal fighting and they will, and they together will be against Judah for all this his anger is not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. God says there's not only external invasion, there's not only internal corruption, but now you're going to have complete social anarchy. People just at each other. Chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, the fourth of these, woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees and right misfortune, which they have prescribed. They rob the needy of justice. They take what is right from the poor of my people, the wid that widows may be their prey, that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your glory without me? They shall bow down among the prisoners and they will fall among the slaves. For all this my anger is not turned away. My hand is stretched out still. God says the fourth thing that's going to happen here is complete social breakdown and injustice. When God has to back away, this is what happens. Invasion, corruption, anarchy, and complete social breakdown and injustice. Any of this sound familiar? I, I think this is prophetic in its overtones. And then God turns and he says, woe to Assyria. Now you, you got to realize, Assyria is the one that caused all these problems. The invasions anyway. The, not, they didn't cause the internal problems, but the invasions were Assyria. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in whose hand is my indignation remember thy rod and thy staff they comfort me he uses those same shepherd concepts here i will send assyria against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath i will give him charge to seize the spoil and take the prey there's little little maher shalosh hashbaz the, the words are right there to seize the spoil and take the prey to tread them down like mire in the streets so God says, I'm letting, he actually says, I'm sending, but I'm going to change that concept to God backing off. Israel never was strong enough to control Canaan on their own. 
God said, I didn't pick you because you were strong. I picked you because you were the weakest, puniest bunch. And I put you in the choice land that everybody wants. And I'm your wall. I'm the only reason you have the strength to stay there, to survive. And three times a year, all your men are to go up to the temple, to the feast, which leaves your borders totally unprotected. But if you'll trust me, I'll make sure nobody covets your land while you're at feast. God says, I'll be the wall of protection. The only reason you ever could live in the, the choice land of Canaan is because of my power, not yours. So as God backs off, as we tell him to leave us alone, the other nations want this beautiful territory. And Assyria becomes the rod of his anger, his means of punishment on rebellious Israel. But it only comes because God simply backs off as he's told to. But it says, um, verse 7, he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. And he says, Are not my princes like kings? Is not Caldo like Carchemish, Hamath like Arpad, Samaria like Damascus? In other words, I've taken all these nations. As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols? Therefore, it will come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. He will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, by my strength of my hand I have done it, by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of people, I have robbed their treasures, I have put down the inhabitants like valiant men. My hand is found like a nest, the riches of the people as one gathers eggs that are left. I have gathered all the earth, and there is no one who has moved his wing or opened his mouth, uh, even made a peep. God says... Assyria is the rod of my chastisement of Israel, but they're not righteous. They don't just intend to chastise. They intend to destroy. Their pride and their arrogance say, we're number one. Nobody can beat us. Our gods are bigger than any others, and we're going to take whatever we want. And God says, they're going to come in and cause chastisement, but then I'm going to deal with them. Shall the axe boast against him who chops with it? Or the saw magnify itself against the one who saws with it? In other words, God says, uh, hey guys, you've gone way beyond what I want you to do. As if a rod could wield itself against the one who lifts it up, or a staff could lift up as it were, not wood. Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his Assyria's fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for fire, and the Holy One for a flame it will burn and devour his thorns and briars. In one day he will consume the glory of his forest and his fruitful field, both body and soul, and they will be as when a sick man wastes away, when the rest of the, then the rest of his trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them down. God says, I'm going to deal with Assyria. When did he do that? Hezekiah. Assyria decided the final coup de grace was Jerusalem, and God cut them down, and they wasted away after that defeat. In just a few years, Assyria was gone, totally gone. There is no residue of Assyria on earth today, and they were once the most powerful nation on earth. It shall come to pass. In that day, the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Israel will again depend on him who defeated them, and will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. The remnant will return. That is the exact name of that first child, Shear Jeshub. The remnant of Jacob, the mighty God, to the mighty God. They'll return to God. And through your people, O Israel, though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant will return. Shear Yashub. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Oh, don't you like that? God allows destruction. When we tell him to go away, he, he can't avoid it. But he says it, that destruction will overflow with righteousness. The flood of destruction will be overcome with good things. For the Lord of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of it all. Therefore, says the Lord God of hosts, O oh, my people who dwell in Zion, don't be afraid of the Assyrians. He'll strike you with the rod and lift up his staff against you as in the manner of Egypt. And yet a very little while and his indignation, the indignation will cease and as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, an ancient uh, battle, uh, Gideon. And his rod, as his rod was on the sea, so he will lift it up as in the manner of Egypt. 
Assyria is going to go down like the Midianites and the Egyptians. It will come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken up against off of your shoulder and the yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Now you have a, a poetic picture here of the coming of Assyria against the land. He comes to Aoth, he passes Migron. At Migmash, he attends his equipment. He's gone along the ridge. He's taken the lodging at Geba. Ram is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galim. Um, cause it to be heard as far as Laish. The poor, O poor Anathoth, Medidma has fled. The inhabitants of Gibeam take refuge. And yet he will remain at Nob that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord of hosts will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down. The haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron. And Lebanon will fall by a mighty one. This is all a picture of when Assyria comes into the land, they look unstoppable. But at a prayer of Hezekiah and the prophecy of Isaiah and the hand of the angel of the Lord, the mightiest nation on earth was literally cut down in one night when God was allowed to work. Now, I went fast through a whole lot of stuff here, but we're trying to fly over the forest today. There will come a rod from the stem of Jesse. It means a shoot, a branch growing. It doesn't mean a rod you beat somebody with. A branch will grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by the sight of the eyes, decide by the hearing of the ears. This branch out of Jesse, Jesse being the father of David, this, this king to come, this Messiah king to come, who will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Messiah means anointed one. He won't judge by what he hears and sees like kings do now, you know, just what they can understand. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. He'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. This is simply the same thing as the child will born, be born prophecy stated in different words. This one will be born who will rule with righteousness and bring justice on earth. And notice what it says in verse 6 and on. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion will, and the fatling together. The little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. The young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play on the cobra's hole. And the weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. And there, they shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain. For the earth is, will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there will be a root of Jesse who will stand as a banner of his people. For the Gentiles will seek him and his resting place will be glorious. It will come to pass in that day the Lord will set his hand against, again a second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria, Egypt, Pathos, Kush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the islands of the sea. Notice. This branch from Jesse will have a righteous eternal rule of wisdom, justice, and equity. Paradise will be restored. End of violence, peace. This is what should have happened when Messiah came. If he would have been received. Do you see the point? And once again, this is not a false prophecy because it didn't come to pass. God intended good things and we wouldn't let him. And so you have plan B. He had to go back. More carnage, but he's coming again. We have to wait for the fulfillment of the rest of this prophecy. But God never intended it that way. And then it says he'll bring in the final remnant. He'll set up the banner of the nations, verse 12, who will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together to disperse of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim will depart. The adversaries of Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not envy Judah. Judah will not harass Ephraim. We're all going to get along, folks, someday. Isn't that great? And they will fly down upon the shoulders of the Philistines to the west. Together they will plunder the people of the east. They'll lay their hands on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon will obey them. The Lord, In other words, all the local troublesome nations will come under peace. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt. That's referring back to the Red Sea exodus when the waters dried up. His mighty 
wind. He will shake this fist over the river. That's the Euphrates. That's the area of Assyria. Strike its seven streams and make men cross over dry shot like they came across the Jordan when they entered Canaan. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. God says, I'm going to put things right and I'm going to bring a second exodus and I'm going to bring the residue of my people home. Sheer Yeshub, the remnant will return. The plunder will be restored. Emmanuel will be the child with us who will rule forever. And in that day, they will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, Praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the people. Make mention of his, that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord. He has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Okay, we kind of did a flight right over the top. These three prophetic kids and the three prophecies of Messiah. God intended much better than we've received. But we won't let him when we won't follow, you know, if God has a treasure for you and says, follow me, I'll take it to you, and you say, no, I won't follow, he can't take you to the treasure. But he comes around and tries again and again and again. God intended we'd be at least 2,000 years into the glory by now. But we refused. Messiah was rejected. That reign of glory had to be postponed. He said, I'm going to prepare a place. And then I'm going to come and get you. And I'm going to take you there. And the reign of glory will happen. One of the most amazing things about God, people, is this. Without ever violating the free will of people. And our ridiculous rebellions. God will eventually bring to pass the kingdom of glory. We keep putting it off, but the book of Revelation tells us how he's going to catalyze things and bring things to a head so that he can finally bring it to pass. But it all happens with the free will persuasion of human beings, not with force and coercion. God will win this battle with love and the power of love alone. We may die in the battle before it's over. But he's the resurrection and the life. Amen. Amen? Messiah has come. We chased him off. But he's coming back. And he rule. He will rule with righteousness. And there will be peace. Forever. Jesus. Interesting picture kind of hard to see sometimes when we read these passages and we get all caught up in the rhetoric but help us to be able to step back and see you have given us tons of evidence to see your intent and your power and your love you intend good things your power shows us that you can do things but when we won't let you you stay close, waiting for us to engage. You're never far away. And yet you let us have our freedom. And eventually you will bring to pass a glorious conclusion that everyone along the way who puts their trust in you, though we may die in the battle of this earth, we will rise to be part of the glorious conclusion. Thank you for these incredible promises, we pray in your name. Amen.